this morning then for our time. Let us return to Isaiah chapter 52. Our text will be found in these last three verses. Isaiah chapter 52 at verses 13 to 15. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which they had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. And what we're looking at here is the opening verses of what has been regarded as the fourth servant song that's found in Isaiah. There are a number of portions in uh, the latter part of Isaiah which are called servant songs and they primarily map out for us the person and the work of the Saviour. And that's what we're here to do this morning, that we might refresh our minds and we trust that it will motivate us and stimulate our hearts that we might fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we have here in these three verses is the opening three verses of the servant song, which goes on into chapter 53. And I'm sure many of us are familiar with Isaiah 53. And the title I want to give to our meditation this morning is Something to Sing About. Something to Sing About. Here we have a song, a song about the Saviour. And if there's anything that's going to make you sing, friends, it should be the Saviour. It should be about this person, this glorious, this wonderful person who has done what no one else could possibly do. And if our tongues are going to be loosened, if our lips are going to be used to sing any song, it should be about the Saviour. We have here about his sufferings and death. Now you might think, well, these are not very nice things to sing about. But friends, if we recognize we're sinners, if we recognize we're lost and we're perishing and without hope in this world, if we recognize our, two, our true plight before a thrice holy God, if we truly have some apprehension of what we were or what we are by nature, and then we come to realize what this person has done, what this person has come from heaven to do, surely this should cause us indeed to be rejoicing and to open our mouths and to praise uh, the living God for what he has done. And we will never stop and we will never tire to extol him and to recommend him and to commend him to you that you too might know the glorious and the wonderful blessings that Jesus Christ has permanently secured for all his people in order to bring about their universal and eternal salvation. So we have therefore Three things that we wish to highlight, one from each verse, because they tell us something very important about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's good to come to his house, it's good to come to worship, and to be reminded about the Saviour. First of all then, verse 13, what have we got here? Well, quite simply, what we have here is Christ the servant. Christ the the servant. Now our Saviour is the only begotten Son of God. He is God of very God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He has no beginning. 
He is eternal. He is the creator. He is the one who has brought this world into being. He's the one who has created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. He's the one who has created the spiritual world. And we have to remind ourselves that there is another world. Another world that's all around us. A spiritual world. A world that we know very, very little about. Only what is revealed to us in the Word of God. But this is the one who has created all of this. He is the great life giver. You have life today. You have spiritual life today. You have, if you're a Christian, you have spiritual life today through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the great life giver. And he's the one who gives eternal life. Now what is eternal life? Well, it's life forevermore. It is, if you might say, it is physical life and it is spiritual life forever. That's what he has given to every single one of his people who have come to him and who have believed upon him and who are joined to him by an unbreakable union. He is the great life giver. There would be no life without the eternally begotten Son of God. Now, friends, what we are to realize here is that this one, this glorious person, this one who is adored in heaven and whose word is obeyed in heaven has come down to earth as a servant. Can we grasp this? We cannot. This is beyond us. But it's true. And when he came into this world, we know that he was conceived not in the normal manner. It was by extraordinary generation. But he was born in the normal manner. But he, was, he had no sin whatsoever. He was absolutely pure and spotless. And when he came into this world, even as a babe in the crib, there we had God in the flesh. The fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. He never divested himself of his deity. That would be impossible. It was veiled. It was hidden. And on rare occasions, he gave some indication of his glory. You could go to the Mount of Transfiguration and to see the splendor there that the, the disciples Peter, James, and John saw. And Peter was able to recount that later on in 1 Peter when he says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen him on the mount. We have seen his glory. We know what it's going to be like when he will return. There he gives us a glimpse and a preview of his glory. But this person who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation we're told in the Philippians chapter 2. No reputation. He became a servant. He didn't just humble himself by taking upon himself our form and nature. That was a great humiliation in itself. But he came as a servant. Had he come as the most illustrious king that this world has ever seen, nevertheless, it would still be an act of humiliation on his behalf. But he came as a servant. He washed the disciples' feet. That's our Savior. That's the Son of God who became the Son of Man. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. Is that not what he did? We have but a little of his life in the Gospels. Oh, it's sufficient, don't get me wrong. 
The minister is not saying we should know more. We have enough. Scripture is complete. But we don't have everything that Jesus did or said, recorded for us in the Gospels. We don't. But we know from the Gospel record that he dealt wonderfully with his disciples. And do we not identify ourselves with the disciples? Do we not see that as the disciples were dull and slow to learn, do we not hold our hands up and say, we fall into that category? And how did Jesus deal with them? Well, friends, as we go through the Gospel of Luke, we know how he dealt with them. We know how he spoke to them precept by precept, line by line. We know that he, he dealt with them tenderly like a mother would deal with her nursing child. That's how he dealt with his disciples. And that's how he deals with us. That's what the, how he deals with his people today. Because we're no any better uh, than the disciples. Is that not true? Can we not identify with that? Of course we can. We look at Peter and how he was a leader. And he was truly a leader. But look at his faults. Look at his failings. Are we going to scold him? Are we going to look down on him? Not at all. Not at all. Instead we will learn from him because when we look at Peter and we look at Andrew and we look upon James and John, we see ourselves. And we see how the Saviour dealt with them. You see that incident when he went and he, he washed their feet. Here he was, the master. And they hung upon his every word. But when they came to this room and when someone should have done this low deed, it was Jesus that did it. He's a servant. He's God's servant. And he came on a mission. And part of that mission, friends, that he would humble himself. No, he couldn't. It would be impossible for him to divest himself of his glory. That would be impossible. But it was hidden. And maybe there are people here today who think little of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, multitudes think little of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not on your own there. Virtually the whole world thinks little of the Son of God. But he became a servant in order that he would be able to undertake all that was required in order to save his people. He shall deal prudently. We've already spoken about the fact that he dealt prudently and graciously with his disciples. But he dealt prudently with everyone. Everyone that he came in contact with. He had the advantage over us. When we deal with people, we don't always know what's going on in their hearts. We don't know what they truly are like. But the Lord Jesus, being God in the flesh, he was able to ascertain those who would come to him and speak to him. And he would know what's really on their heart. And he would know what they needed to hear, even although their, their question did not really reveal what was in their heart. We could think of Nicodemus. And are we not glad that Jesus had a conversation with Nicodemus? Or maybe we should say it the other way around. Are we not glad that Nicodemus went to Jesus at night and he had a conversation with Jesus? But Jesus did not enter into a, a, a theological or a scriptural conversation with Nicodemus. Why not? Because Nicodemus was dead. He was dead spiritually. And the Lord Jesus recognized that this man here needed the gift of the new birth. He needed to be saved first. He needed to, be under, he needed to undergo a spiritual resurrection. There's no point in opening up the scriptures to that man. Why? Because he was dead to spiritual things. And that's why Jesus, in some sense, cut him short. We know thou art a teacher who has come from God, for no man could do these things unless God was with him. 
What did Jesus say? Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Jesus dealt with him prudently. It was to his eternal well-being. For we do believe that the gospel arrow struck his heart. And we do believe that Nicodemus was truly saved and converted because he identified with Christ. At the end, he was prepared when the nation had rejected him. And when Jesus was despised, Nicodemus nailed his colors to the mast. And he went and recovered the body of the Lord Jesus, along with Joseph of Arimathea. Jesus knows how to deal with us. He deals prudently. He dealt prudently with the religious leaders. We know that basically it's true to say that all of the religious leaders virtually rejected the Lord Jesus. And they wanted to trap him. They would ask him questions. Not that they particularly wanted an answer or that it was something that concerned them. They simply wanted to trap him in order that they would be able to go to Pilate. But Jesus knew how to deal with them. We could think of the rich young ruler. What a very promising individual he was. A rich young ruler, a synagogue ruler, a religious person. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Would we not like if young people would come forward to the minister or to the office bearers and that they might have this question on their lips? What must I do? He recognized he, he was missing something with all his religion, with all his riches, with his life. Yet he knew there was one thing missing, the one thing needful, and he did not have that security. He didn't know that he was going to have eternal life. And he went to Jesus. What a person to go to. Here is eternal life before them. Jesus Christ himself. He couldn't have asked a better person. But as you know what happened, Jesus exposed his idolatry. And this person didn't really want eternal life. He wanted to hold on to his possessions. That was more important to him than eternal life. Jesus Christ the servant shall deal prudently. And we are delighted that he did deal prudently because ultimately he went to Calvary. His disciples, well-meaning they were, Peter again, you're not going to go to Calvary. You're not going to be crucified. Not for you, Lord. Not that way for you. Not for the Son of God. You are the Christ. What did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Here was an apostle. Not possessed with the devil, but being used by the devil. Jesus was prudent. He knew it. A wonderful servant. A servant, friends, that we can commend to you. Because today, he's no longer a servant. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But here they were told, Behold my servant. Now this prophecy was given to principally to those Jews who were in captivity in Babylon. And it was reminding them that they would come out of Babylon and they would be restored. But towards the end of the chapter, there, 
they are given a glimpse of a far greater deliverance that was yet to come. Or we might say a far greater deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would deliver them, his people, ultimately from sin, from Satan, and from death itself. So then, first of all, Christ the servant. Secondly, friends, we want to notice here Christ the sufferer. We have it in verse 14, where the prophet says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. We need to thoroughly engross ourselves in the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have it recorded in four Gospels. Why? Well, obviously, the Holy Spirit wants us to know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, truly suffered. And there was no one that ever suffered like Christ. Many were astonished at thee. He was taken, first of all, from Gethsemane, and he was taken to the, the high priest, to Ananias and Caiaphas. And there these religious people abused him. They slapped his face. They pulled his hair. They spat on his face. Then he was taken to Pilate and to, and to Herod. Pilate flogged him. Herod himself and his men of war abused him. Before his crucifixion, he was flogged. It was quite normal before someone was crucified to be flogged. And very often that flogging would kill them. There would be no need for crucifixion. Jesus was flogged. Then he had to bear his cross. Then he was nailed to the cross. Nails put through his hands, his feet. A crown of thorns upon his head. A spear thrust through his side. No one ever suffered like the Lord Jesus Christ. His visage, his appearance was so marred more than any man. What that literally means is he didn't really look human. He was ugly on the cross. Humanly speaking, visibly to your eyes, if you looked at Christ at the cross, you would turn your eyes away. You would not look upon that horrible sight of the Son of God, the Christ, the sufferer. The wickedness of human nature. There we see it. Go to the cross. You know, people say if they saw a great person, then they would, they would admire him and they would love him. Absolute, utter nonsense. They saw a perfect individual there, the God-man, and they despised him and rejected him and hated him and ill-treated him so that he suffered like no one else has ever suffered. His face, his form, everything was affected by the beatings, the treatment, and ultimately the crucifixion. His legal rights were taken away. His human rights were taken away. He was treated like trash. The offscoring of the earth. Christ, the sufferer. Does this make us sing? Well, it should, friends should make us sing why 
Oh, we are not going to be afraid to repeat it. But friends, he suffered in the room and in the place of sinners. He suffered in order that you would not suffer. He received what all human beings re should receive. He was a substitute. He was not suffering for his own sin because he was sinless. He was the pure, spotless Lamb of God. And we know that wicked men carried out this. We know, and they will, they will be held responsible for it. But ultimately we look up and we see the hand of God being upon him. God's hand was applied upon him. And it was all part of his great and glorious master plan whereby preachers might go forth and be able to tell people about the wonderful sufferings of the Savior and how he suffered vicariously in our room and in our place. The world and those who saw the, cru the crucifixion they said, it's all over. This is finished. What a disgrace. Look at him. He saved others. He cannot save himself. If he is the Son of God, let him come down from the cross. They said all kinds of terrible things to the Lord Jesus when he was suffering there. But you know, friends, Christ was there absolutely beautiful. Why? Because he was fulfilling the will of God. He was submitting to the will of God. That's why he was able to say a few moments before all these things that I have described happened to him. He was able to say to his people, in his, or he was able to say in front of his people as he was offering up his high priestly prayer, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. There, that prayer of triumph, there before he was going to go to Gethsemane and before he went to Golgotha, he was able to say, I have glorified thee on the earth. And there at the cross, there as he was a pathetic spectacle, we might say, he was glorifying God. And he was undertaking a great triumph over the powers of darkness, over our arch enemy, sin, the devil and death itself were all conquered there on Calvary's tree. Many were astonished at thee. Many shook their heads. Many ran from him. But friends, we delight in him. Because he is our hope. Earlier in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, again, talking about the Saviour, I give my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You know, there are some who don't like this. Some Christians don't like this. To them, it's all kind of blood and gore. But friends, this is the gospel. And this is the Son of God who undertook this willingly and voluntarily because he had to. There was no other way to be saved. There was no other way for God to work out a way of salvation. This was it. Do you think God would put his Son through this if there was another way? There is no other way. Sin had to be punished. And this was the way it was to be done. The Son of God had to be our substitute. And recognizing the seriousness of sin. And recognizing the seriousness of, our, of the consequences. If sin is not dealt with. Surely we can sing. And surely we can praise the Lord for what he has done. 
Yes, it is bloody. Yes, it is horrible. Yes, he suffered. And his physical sufferings were nothing in comparison with his emotional and his spiritual sufferings. Nothing. But this is our hope. And this is what the Savior undertook for all his people. Oh, Christian, are you then going to be upset when someone in the office persecutes you in some way or doesn't want your company or treats you not as you should be treated or someone in your family rebukes you or makes a a laughing stock off you because you're a Christian or someone at school you don't go to church do you and you run and you hide and you're ashamed look at the Son of God look at them there on the cross see he was crucified amongst criminals he was treated as the vilest of of persons the Son of God. We are to follow Him. We are to see He suffered. And He suffered for His people. And will His people not suffer then for Him? When you see what He has given to His people, that great, that glorious, that eternal hope that is before His people, surely, friends, we will. And as we suffer, as you will, ask for grace that you might benefit from the suffering. Very often we pray Take us away from suffering. Take this suffering away from me. Instead we should cry out. Give grace. That I might benefit from this. Recognizing that God is sovereign. Finally. Point three. We have here Christ the Savior. 15 verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. And I put it to you, friends. Here we have Christ the Savior. And particularly the message, the gospel message as it goes forth. We have here this word sprinkle. It could well be startle. It could well be translated startle. And what a startling message the Christian gospel is. It is absolutely startling. Why is it startling? Well, it's startling because ultimately it is God's answer to our plight. And we are the ones who has offended God by our sins. And we would think if we were dealing with this situation ourselves, we would think, well, we are the ones who have offended God. Therefore, we are the ones who should try to make reconciliation with God. But that's not what happened at all. God who has been offended is the one who has taken the initiative. He has done something, something positive, something that will bring about the desired result. He has done, he has acted. And this should indeed startle us. Because it's all to be attributed to the living God. And the message is startling because it transforms individuals. Individuals are transformed. The gospel is still the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that's, quite, that's simply telling us that the gospel is universal. It's for everyone. And it's simply telling us also that there is none beyond the pale. There is none that have no hope. 
But it is startling, friends, because it demands a response. What do I mean? Well, the Christian gospel is about the Son of God who came, who suffered, and who died. Many people do exactly the same thing. In fact, we might say everyone does exactly the same thing. This world is a world of suffering. We come into this world, we suffer, some more than others, and we die. That's what happened. That's what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's something different, friends. There's something about his life and about his death that affects every single one of us. It's not like someone like Napoleon. What happened to Napoleon? He was born, he did what he did, he was a great man, and he died. So what? It doesn't affect you and me. We could say the same for Julius Caesar. He came into this world, he did what he did. Then he died. We could say the same for our late queen. She came into this world, she did what she did, and then she died. So what? It doesn't affect us, does it? But the, the, the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ affects every single one of us because this is the heart of the gospel. This is what Paul says to the Corinthians when he's seeking to open up and explain the glorious doctrine of the, re of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died. But then he goes on. How that Christ died for our sins. And this is a startling thing about the gospel. Christ has died for our sins. Napoleon came and lived and did all that he did, but he didn't do it for me or you. The same can be said for the queen. She came, she lived, she died. So what? The Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven. He suffered. He lived, he suffered, he died for our sins. He was doing these things as our substitute. And therefore, it requires a response from you. This is what will prick your hearts. This is what will awake your conscience. Christ has done something that has affected all mankind. He has died in the room and place of sinners. We're all sinners. There are no exceptions. And this is the very essence, this is the very heart, this is the life beat of the gospel. And this is, this is what requires a response from all of us friends. Christ died for our sins. Did he die for your sins? Have you put your faith and hope and trust upon the Savior? This is what this is all about. It's about having our sins forgiven. It's about someone being our substitute. God requires perfect, perpetual obedience to his law. That is terrifying. Why? Because we cannot possibly do this. We cannot achieve it. It's beyond us. But God hasn't loosed his standard. This is what's required. Well, our Savior, the Son of God, has achieved it. Lived a perfect life. Died offering up a perfect sacrifice. Pleasing and acceptable to God. And those who believe upon him, they receive his righteousness. Their sins are forgiven. Oh, did you hear that today? Your sins are forgiven when you come to the Lord Jesus. Why are they forgiven? They are forgiven because he has paid the price. God has not gone soft on sin. He cannot. It would be against his nature I am the Lord, I change not. He hates sin from all eternity. He will hate sin to all eternity. And that's why he punished Christ. 
And that's why Paul goes about with the gospel that Christ died for our sins. There was a purpose in it for our sins as a substitute. What's required of you then? What's required of you is to put your faith and your hope upon the Son of God. You to put your faith upon this glorious servant, this suffering servant, this one who is the Savior. There's no other. None. No other. But him and him alone. Have we something to sing about then? Well, the Christian does. He has something to sing about. Why? Well, his sins are forgiven. With all his faults and failings and shortcomings and unbelief, his sins are forgiven. Oh, we don't say that in order that it might be a license to sin. No, far from it. But we delight in what Jesus Christ has done. The suffering servant. Is he then your saviour? Well, this is why we proclaim this. In order that you might have your faith and hope upon this person. That you might call upon him. How can I be saved then? What, what must I do? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You are to believe upon him today. You are to call upon him now. You are to seek him now. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. That's what the Bible teaches us. We are to seek the Savior. And once you find the Savior, friends, you'll have something to sing about. You'll have something glorious. Your heart will be warmed. You'll have new life. And you'll have something divine and glorious and wonderful to sing about. Amen. And may the Lord bless his word to us.